Ah. All right, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I'm Richard Trenholm from technology website Cena, and I'm joined by Dan Widmeyer of Bolt Thread. Uh, and you are uh, innovating in something that we've, uh, we've had nature doing for, for, for millions of years. So, yep, yep. so uh, what is it that your company does? What is, the, what is the Bolt Thread is doing? So Bolt Thread is a technology company based around the idea that the materials that go into the clothing we wear are ripe for innovation and have not seen major innovation in the last 30 to 50 years. And so we're really dedicated to taking this inspiration from nature, from spiders, silkworms, and other sources, and using that to drive a new revolution in innovative materials. OK. So why do we need synthetic spider silk? Like what's wrong with, what are the challenges of using spiders or, or silkworms to, to, create, uh, to create silk? Sure. Uh, so spiders have a really obvious problem. It's the reason you never see a spider-based anything. They eat each other when you try and farm them. <laughs> okay. uh, it, so that just doesn't work. And, and silk's been around for 5,000 years. I think we know the pluses and minuses of that material. Um, it doesn't wash very well. It's kind of fragile. It feels great. Like, that's a great thing. It's an ultimate luxury material. Um, so what if we could fix all the bad things and keep all the good things and maybe bring the good things from the spider silk over as well? Or the good things you could do with any material and make everything better on a performance and sustainability basis? Not the either or trade-off we usually have today. Right. So what are some actual advantages, some specific advantages of uh, synthetic silk? Like what can you do with it? Sure. So we're working on all the things you can think of. But to give you a few examples, I'm not going to spoil what we're going to do for our launch. Right. But um, you, know, you could make it easier to care for. You know, silk has a big problem with that right now. Uh, you can make it stronger. You can look at things like UV resistance, waterproofness, uh, things like stretch and durability, uh, all properties that we're heavily engaged in right now. OK. And how strong are we talking? Are we talking bulletproof, or what, what are we talking about? Uh, that's, the, that's the upper bound, is, right. is as strong as you know, silk, spider silk, six times uh, stronger than Kevlar. Um, okay. But for us, you know, that's not exactly what you need to make a great consumer product. And so we look at that as kind of the range of things we can do and then figure out what fits the need of the specific product we want to manufacture and put in the market. OK. And uh, so why, why now? Like, this is, like you say, there's been, uh, been the same thing for sort of 30 or 40, yeah. 50 years. Why, why are we able to do this now? Sure. Um, this is a biology-mediated process. You know, uh, I, I won't go into the technology too much, but at one step, we make the silk in yeast, like making beer. Um, the, the biotechnology underlying the process to make protein polymers is changing rapidly right now. Uh, I have a PhD in chemistry and chemical biology. It's where I started the idea and the technology for the company. And uh, those tools are changing at kind of a Moore's Law pace right now. And that's what's really enabling what we're seeing happen, not just with, with, with Silk and my, and my company, but a number of other uh, biology-driven manufacturing businesses. OK. And what's the plan in terms of products? When, what is, what's your plan for launching? So uh, next year, you'll see us launching a consumer product. Uh, I'm not going to spoil the launch right now. My marketing people will strangle me when I get back to San Francisco. But um, it will be a, a Bolt-branded product launched on the market for sale okay. next year. So the idea is that you're going to partner with a big brand. Is that the plan? So we, we have a dual strategy. We, so we have what we're going to launch next year with um, uh, our own product. But we also have partnerships with some large brands who I also can't announce quite yet, but uh, who will use it as a branded ingredient strategy uh, in their products, where you can buy somebody's uh, consumer apparel with Bolt in it. Okay. And uh, the, uh, it's, it's not just clothes as well. There are other possible potential uses, right? So, so if you think about like the polyester or the nylon that goes into your clothing, it shows up everywhere in your life. It's part of the, it's one of the, the greatest technological miracles of the 20th century, in my opinion. A lot of what we take, advantage, uh, take for granted today uh, comes from polymers. Silk, the, heart of the, the, the technology is really just a polymer. Uh, and so you can make anything. You can make medical devices. You can make uh, solids like Legos. You can make uh, fibers for uh, composites and for apparel. Uh, we happen to have a lot of expertise and a lot of background in choosing apparel as the space we want to start in. Right, right, OK. And uh, so why hasn't anyone done this before? Like, what, what's, uh, what, you know, why hasn't anyone kind of uh, uh, managed to bring this technology to reality? I mean, lots of people have been trying, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is the, the, the beauty of silk, spider silk and others, is that you can, um, you can go into nature, you can find a spider with a web, you can take a little sample of it, and you can, you can mechanically test it. We, we stretch it until it breaks, tensile strength. Uh, and you say, wait, this is really amazing. Why can't I just get a lot of it? Well, first, you can't farm the spiders. They eat each other. Uh, and second, you have this biotechnology problem of how do you inexpensively produce proteins at a large scale? And you know, if you walk into an academic lab like my background doing molecular biology uh, and you ask someone for a gram of protein, they'll probably punch you uh, because it's really, really hard to do. People spend their whole six-year PhD thesis trying to do you know, a few milligrams. Um, 
What's changing now is these underlying tools I spoke about in biology, making it faster, easier to do, and, and we have a lot of experience in the field understanding the nitty gritty of the specific problems at the sure. DNA, protein, and, and cellular level. Okay, and, and does it scale then? Is, that, is, is there potential to actually you know, mass produce this stuff? The great, other great questions. That's, that's the other challenge. If you have the technology and the strain, can you then uh, grow, make enough of it to, to make mass uh, margins of apparel? Uh, we have capabilities in-house. that essentially scales with what we would call our, the size of the, the brewing vessel we put it in. Uh, we do this at 4,000 liters right now uh, with a partner, and early next year, I can't tell you who the partner is, but we'll be doing it north of 200,000 liters, okay. uh, making the, the launch material for next year's launch. Right, okay. Cool. So that's commercial scale. That can go, we can, then you just duplicate the number of units and it's as big as you want to be. Right, okay. And uh, what's it like as a technology company to, to work with, with fashion brands? Are they open to this kind of thing? Or is uh, it a difficult conversation to start? It's an easy conversation to start. We get a huge amount of interest. The idea of a novel okay. material is something that, that brands love. The idea that you can differentiate your product from someone else with the materials is, is fascinating. It gets a little more complicated and we have to go into like, the science and start explaining like, how we're going to get to where they want to go. Mm. Um, but the, the, the interest is, is immense uh, in what we're doing and how we can partner together. Okay, okay. And uh, so like, I guess what would be the environmental impact of, uh, of, of synthetic soap? Sure. Um, it's one of the things that you know, I start talking about performance and things like that. It's, it's one of the things I think is the long-term big value in the, in the company and the technology. Yeah. Uh, it turns out that when, when biology grows a material, it's inherently biocompatible with nature. Uh, not yeah. a surprising concept, but uh, it's not worth stating. You know, we see this as being immense advantages on the sustainability side. And I'm not naive enough to claim that with specific numbers until we've done the LCA analysis, which we're currently working on, but you gotta be at full scale to do that properly. Um, but back of the envelope says it's gonna come out much, much better. Okay, and you mentioned that you've recently hired someone who worked for the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, is that right? Yeah, we've, uh, on the, another good point, you know, founded by three scientists, mm. what do we possibly know about apparel? Uh, so one, uh, I'm married to a fashion designer, so I know a little, a little right. bit there. Um, and, and then we've gone and hired a lot of really great experts who have been at apparel startups before, who have worked for companies like Nike, Now, Sims Fishing, uh, Patagonia, places like that. Yeah. And, and so we've been bringing in kind of the best of the best in talent in both how to build these kinds of companies as well as how you look at the sustainable life cycle of a, of a piece of apparel. It's, textiles is one of the dirtiest industries on the planet. Um, there was a great article in some of the chemistry news recently about how to clean this up. And the, that industry knows it as well. And we're all doing a lot of work to try and make this better. And a lot of people have recognized this as one of the technologies that can right, get us right, there. Okay. So as a technology company, you're, you're, you know, you're making synthetic silk. It could potentially be used for, like, say, medical devices or for uh, composites, materials, that kind of thing. Why did you choose to go into, uh, into, uh, into fashion and clothing? So it's the one market I can point to where for 5,000 years a similar material has been prized by consumers, loved, and, you know, Whole empires were built over silk. The Silk Road was built. It's got it in the name. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, it, it's it's a material in a market that's large, global, and it's been around for a long time, and it's well understood. Okay. And uh, so, I mean, when you talk about scale and stuff like, what's the cost going to be like for this? Is it going to be a consumer product or, or, or not? It, it'll be a premium consumer product, as many startups start. I mean, you can look at a lot of consumer mm -hmm. products that launch that start at kind of not at the tippy top of the market, but in the premium segment, uh, and that's I think where we envision this going. Um, that being said, compared to the, if I did this in an academic lab and spent a few million dollars to make one kilogram of silk, we're nowhere in that ballpark. Right. <laughs> we're in the, you know, we're in a place where it'll be viable to make consumer products that every person could afford. Okay. Uh, might not be the cheapest thing you buy, and that might not be the right thing to do for the sustainability side of things as well, but it won't be so expensive, nobody can afford it. Right, okay. And there's potential for you to make different types of fabrics that do different types of things, is that right? That's the, that's the beauty of the underlying mm -hmm. technology is that, you know, uh, the, the, what we call the property potential of a polymer, a specific protein we make into a fiber, uh, is dictated by the chemistry. And we can make 10 to the 160 different silk polymers on our process. Okay. And, give you, and they all have different properties. They would all have different chemistries, different properties. Right. Uh, and so if you think about that 10 with 160 zeros behind, it's a, a massive number. So one might be waterproof, and then one might be uh, particularly strong, one might be light, that, that kind of thing. And then the real, the real fun happens when you start figuring out how to mix those properties together. Right. So, okay. And it's a computational problem, actually. It's a place where data pays. I'm actually thinking of the last people who were here talking about data and fashion. Totally different data, but yeah. uh, data coming into how you predict properties and imbue them into a material. Okay. And what's your plan for the Bolt brand? Are we going to buy Bolt clothes, or, or how's that going to work? Um, 
Yeah, I think you're going to see both, right? So I, I would love... The real thing I want to see is this is an incredible material. There's a great need for innovation in this space, mm. and I'd like to see it everywhere. Uh, and that's why we have both of the avenues we're pursuing. To build our own brand, to put our apparel out there, and not, not to ignore, building your own brand is, if you can do it right, great business. Um, but also to do the branded ingredient strategy with partners uh, to make sure that we're, we're getting the maximum distribution and reach. When you have something that's better and, and you think the, the world and think consumers need innovation and improve materials, make sure that we get it as many places as we can. Okay. So you mentioned earlier that equivalent might be, say, Gore-Tex or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gore-Tex one of the few examples in the mm -hmm. last 30-ish uh, years that have uh, done this strategy well and made a meaningful improvement in performance and brought that to consumers. Uh, the other one I think of is Lycra and Coolmax. Uh, and those were great innovations, uh, brought a lot of advantages. Today, actually, everyone in this crowd probably has Lycra in their clothing somewhere. Uh, it might be generic spandex, but um, it's, a, it's a ubiquitous invention. And I think silk can go on that same path and expand upon it greatly in things that have not been possible with petroleum polymers. Right, right, okay. And uh, so how kind of integrated is the company? You mentioned that it's, it's a very vertically integrated company. Yeah, um, I would argue we're one of the most vertically integrated apparel companies on the planet. You know, we call it sugar to shelf. Uh, we start by buying corn to turn right. that into sugar, or it could be sugar beets or sugar cane or whatever it is. We take that all the way through to design and, and retail uh, of our apparel. Not today, but in next year when we're doing okay. it ourselves. So is that the plan then? You want to become like a fashion brand and have designers in-house and that kind of thing? Yeah, and we yeah. have many of those people today. Uh, and that's, that's a piece of the brand, right? That's part of it. Um, I, I think, you know, I'm a data-driven guy. I'm a scientist. Mm. Uh, we're going to follow what the market tells us in terms of how to take our product and really make people's lives better with the uh, apparel they wear and the materials that go into them. Right, and you're very much aiming kind of high street, average consumers, not just sort of techie types, but actually... Yeah, no, I think, I think the, the, the real day will be when, uh, the real success point will be when uh, an average consumer looks and says, hey, I want to buy something with Bolt on it, because I know that stands for quality, uh, high performance, and innovative materials. And it's not just, you know, the people who are wandering around San Francisco working at tech startups, the people wandering around Web Summit here, uh, but everybody. Right, sure, sure. And could this be the end of uh, sort of the current silk industry? Are you, you going to disrupt spiders? Uh, spiders, yes, but they have no industry to speak of, <laughs> right. so to speak, uh, uh, yet. Um, silkworms, you know, that's not, it's one material we can go into, but really it's a diverse platform. We could go into, every, you know, we could make things that are like anything or like nothing ever before. Mm -hmm. um, and you're also going to have to remember that we're going to be pretty volume constrained from, from day one since we're building this whole supply chain. Right. And because of that, I don't know if we're really taking ever anyone's business away in the beginning. We're, we're really about uh, providing a, a new material, a new alternative, and it might end up blended in with other people's stuff uh, as a performance additive uh, over time. So uh, in the beginning, no, I don't think anyone is uh, going to have to worry that we're going to show up with the entire market worth of silk. Right, right. So the, technolog the technological challenges are fairly obvious. Um, you know, it's a very difficult thing to do. But what about um, on the kind of fashion side? What are the challenges that you've, that you've faced actually getting into the kind of clothing industry? So it's first us, well, a problem on our side of learning, uh, understanding what the, how the industry works, the dynamics, uh, the people. You know, uh, if I think of two industries that don't overlap much, uh, Biotechnology and fashion are two like that the, the Venn diagram has little or no overlap whatsoever. Right. Um, so it starts there, and then bringing on great people. Uh, as you alluded to earlier, we hired um, a, a great person in Sue Levin from, uh, used to be Lucy Activewear and Nike before that, uh, hired a fantastic VP of product in Jamie Bainbridge from now and before that, um, a number of places everywhere from Nike to Sims Fishing. Uh, and bringing in really smart people who can help guide us in that part that most scientists have no clue on how to do. Uh, I would also claim then that having, uh, you know, my, my wife of 10 years now, uh, being in the fashion design industry, I, I, by osmosis, learned a little bit of stuff. Right, right. So what do you think that, is there anything that you, you've learned as a company that perhaps uh, other startups wouldn't necessarily know, but you've picked up from being, uh, interacting with uh, the fashion industry? Yeah, you know, I think fashion is interesting to me because it t literally every person on the planet can understand what you mean, right? Like every, every moment of every day, people are touched by the product. And um, 
it's, it's so ubiquitous that you have to interact with the consumer. A, a lot of other technology startups, you know, you can live in a B2B space, you can live in like on the back end of someone's uh, process, and, and we may have been able to go that way, but you really have to have what the consumer wants fixed in your mind and be very focused on providing value there. And I think that's forced us to learn a lot of things that most times the science and research part of innovation sits far away from. And right. today, you can go into my labs and talk to a molecular biologist, and they know quite a bit about apparel and fashion and consumers and what they want. Okay. So, so do you think it's important then for startups to uh, not just have, like, a, like you say, like a group of scientists, but then to look for other people with, with different skills? Oh, yeah. And that's one of the, you know, one of the hallmarks of our culture is curiosity. Right. Um, we have a lot of people who are very curious, and we'll have every, every Friday we have a talk and a, and a catered lunch where everyone kind of gets together and talks to people in the company. And you'll have everything from a guest designer coming in to talk to okay. someone who does uh, industrial biotechnology and talks about fermentation and scale up to someone who's talking about the nitty gritty of polymer physics. And everyone in the company is mixed together, fascinated, asking great questions. You get scientists asking great consumer questions. You get uh, you know, some of our fashion people asking great scientific questions. Uh, and it's a really fun blend there to mix the, you get some diversity of that culture and you know, fuel that curiosity. Sure. Uh, do you think there's any other big brands that have a kind of uh, forward looking attitude to technology? Is there anyone doing interesting stuff and trying to innovate? I think a lot of people are trying to innovate. Very few I see working on the materials. It's such a weird blend of expertise. I mean, how many, how many PhDs in chemistry or biology are employed by you know, anyone in the, in the consumer apparel space? Probably right. a pretty small number. Um, I think that's what makes it so interesting as a partnership when brands come to us and want to do work together. Uh, and, and we really love that because it gives us, it feeds our, our curiosity, it feeds our desire to make new stuff. We learn a ton. Uh, I think it's kind of great for everyone. And then we show people kind of a, an idea that's uh, so novel that it's just awe-inspiring when they come visit our space. Right, right. And so um, beyond clothing, like, what's the kind of really out there possible uses for, uh, for synthetic oh, clothing? Uh, I've been asked all kinds of crazy things. Mm. Uh, everyone's asked from making a space elevator cable to you know, making a cosmetic to making the next uh, upholstery for a, for a luxury car. Right. So, so I, get, I get a little bit of everything. I think uh, the potential is immense, but a really good company has to be able to focus in on one thing it can do really well as a startup, launch that product on the market and, and do that very, very well. And that's what we're very focused on today, right? It's why we're in the apparel space. It's why we uh, are, are working on launching our own brand as well as working with partners. And, um, and so that's really the mindset's there for everyone across the company. Um, right. we, we look forward to the day that we get to dream again. Well, we dream. Well, we write them down on a piece of paper and my scientists hate me when I add to the list. But, um, but, but there, there'll be a day when we go back and look at some other stuff as well. Cool, okay. And uh, I know you probably get asked this a lot, but uh, I'm sure it's what everyone in the room is thinking. Spider-Man web shooters, can you make those? Ooh, now the, the shooter itself becomes a problem. Right. But making the material that goes in the shooter, no problem. Right. We've, got, we've got that under control. It's, it's interesting, right? Because that's one thing that everyone can wrap their mind around, and everyone knows whether they're thinking about it actively or not, of uh, an example of what that property potential this material is. That whole franchise of comic books and movies is based upon the fundamental science that you can take uh, you know, the, the piece of the web, test it. It's stronger than pretty much anything out there. Mm. And, and it could be a really cool superpower for, for a superhero. But what if you can just make the material without needing the superpower? Now, you've got to make the web slinger. That's a, that's a mechanical engineer's problem. I'll hire a couple of those and we'll work on it. Right, right, OK. OK, well, look forward. So you're launching next year. That's the plan, is it? That's the plan. OK, cool. Well, we'll look out for it. Dan, thanks very much. Thank you.